A few months ago, I met Dr. David Greenspan in the first year linear algebra class. I was quite surprised to see a medical doctor having spent so many years on medical training, taking an introductory math course. I got to sit down with him after he graciously accepted my invitation for an interview. And now, you have a chance to hear his amazing story. So I, my job has two major components. And at first, I'm a clinician, so I have to make diagnoses. So I work with a hospital. In my case, this was the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario. And I work as a diagnostic pathologist, looking at specimens from children and trying to make a diagnosis, for example, of what tumor that they have or what disease they have. And this is usually just using a, a light microscope with direct microscopy. And it's just image analysis, but it's not mathematical image analysis. It's more just um, impressionistic image analysis. But like many academic physicians, I have a second life, and my second life is about 50% of my time, and it involves working with two research groups. And the work that I, the research groups that I work with is the experimental research group at the University of Ottawa Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine. There's an investigative pathology research group of which I'm a member. And I also have an appointment to the CHEO Research Institute, which is a dedicated institute to do research that's associated with the hospital at the Children, Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario. And uh, under both those rubrics, I have two main, two main research assignments or two main research projects. My first research project involves a disease called Hirschsprung's disease, which is a disease where babies are born without proper innervation of their colon, and the babies are born with severe constipation that could actually be lethal. Current therapy involves surgical excision of the disease segment, but that's major abdominal surgery in a baby. And so what we're trying to do is use bioengineering, in other words, stem cell technologies, to try to repopulate the nerves without necessitating surgery. So maybe one day there could be a simple bioengineering solution to this disease and therefore spare the patient the major operation. What we've noted is, is that the problem becomes mathematical quite quickly because we realize that we're, in essence what we're trying to do is re-establish a neural network. And in order to establish a neural network, one needs to understand what the parameters of the neural network are. For example, what minimal neural network requirements are there to have a gut contract. And so we've encountered all sorts of interesting mathematical problems. The other research life that I have is looking at developmental biology, and in my case it's specifically placentas. So the placenta is the organ that supplies the fetus in the uterus via the mother. It's how the mother supplies the fetus with food and nutrients, because obviously the baby can't breathe in the mother's stomach and it can't eat. All that job is done by the mother through the conduit of the placenta, and my job is to look at the placenta and try to determine if it's a normal placenta or if there's some abnormalities. And in my clinical hospital job, I just do it by visual impression, looking at the slide and saying, this one looks normal, this one looks abnormal. But what in my research life, I want to advance the field. So I want to apply more rigorous criteria mathematical criteria to say this pattern, this visual pattern, is a normal pattern and this is not a normal pattern and therefore we could have not, not, not um, um, subjective but objective firm criteria. And so um, one of my roles is to try to help develop firm objective criteria for normal versus abnormal placental growth. So as an academic, clinical, and research pathologist, my role in life is to look at images, to look at pictures, both pictures of a growth specimen and microscopic pictures of a specimen, and try to determine what's going on. And that's my clinical life. And then in research, to try to learn new things that we don't know yet. And for many years, actually, I've struggled with how to understand these visual images and how to teach trainees, because I'm also in a teaching program. So how do I teach my students how to appreciate and understand the visual appearance that's sitting in front of them? And to be honest, I went through many, many iterations, many trials and tribulations to try to learn how can we best understand visual information. And I took many approaches. In fact, to give you one example, one approach I took was to study visual arts and to go to museums and, and to study a, a branch of educational theory called visual literacy. And that only got me so far. 
And in fact, I, I ran a course at the University of Ottawa teaching people how to analyze slides using fine art, and I actually took them to the National Gallery. But I, I realized that visual descriptions and what we call morphological descriptions and qualitative observations would only get one so far. And what I realized is that there's a whole world of quantitative observation. And my first concern actually was that if I got into this world of quantitative observation, perhaps it wouldn't be as beautiful as the more poetic or prosaic descriptions of the qualitative observations. But what I found quite rapidly was that it was equally beautiful and equally abstract and had its own poetry that was just as compelling. And so really I encounter taking an image and trying to mathematically analyze it more rigorously than we just do with words really comes into my life in several ways. One is there's a major trend in pathology to have automated computer analysis because Manpower is a problem. So we now have scanning technologies where slides can be scanned, the files can be stored, the files can be shipped all over the world. But we also have now technologies that are reading these slides in an automated manner. And for example, for cytology, which is a certain type of pathology where one is looking at just cells, it's very routine to have a computer do an initial screen. And then the pathologist, the human only, comes in and looks at the material that the computer has pre-screened. I've been fortunate to have some access to some of the software that goes into this, and the mathematics is tremendously rigorous and tremendously complicated, but also quite beautiful. And so I realized that in order for a pathologist to really be up with the times, you needed to have a sense of the underlying mathematical underpinnings. The other thing is in my research life, as I've alluded to, I'm looking at these uh, at a placenta. And what a placenta really is, is in many ways it reminds me of a tree, because it's a branching structure that bifurcates and bifurcates, and it starts with these stems, and it, it ends in these like almost like foliage of these li little small structure. And so it really reminds one of a tree, and so I began to wonder, knowing that people have used a branch of mathematics called fractals to look at trees, I start to wonder, can we use fractals to look at placentas? So I literally went out and bought Ben Mandelbrot's book about the fractal geometry of nature. And I was trying to go online and catch up for all the missing mathematics, but I was having a lot of difficulty. When I was an undergraduate at the University of Toronto approximately 10 years ago, I selected my courses based on the requisites for medical school. And unfortunately at the time, all that was required for mathematics was an introductory calculus course, but there was no um, overt requirement for an algebra course. And because of that, I realized 20 years later, I was having tremendous difficulty understanding Mandelbrot's work and even other works in the direct pathology literature that was important to my day-to-day -day life. And I, at first, I tried to compensate. I looked at online tutorials. But at some point, I realized that I think I need to take the plunge. I think I need to go back and formally address important gaps in my primary education. It took some courage, but I thought, you know, I'm not getting any younger, and now is the time. And I enrolled in a linear algebra course to try to fill in the rudiments with the intention of going on, taking a second year course, taking courses on topology, taking courses on advanced transformation, taking courses on um, visual analysis, even maybe some computer courses, and over time to, to really catch up with the theoretical complexity that's really infusing and taking over my field and that I don't want to get caught, lost behind. So one thing that I would, a message I would like to get out is to tell students to learn from my mistakes. So my father's a doctor and I wanted to be a doctor since I was probably two years old. And so I would really focus on the biology courses and I treated math in undergraduate and in high school as something that I needed to do well on but didn't need to truly understand. And so I would do the problem sets but half sleep during the lectures and certainly ignore the proofs because there were hardly any proofs at the undergraduate or high school level. But it caught up with me. It caught up with me and impeded my ability to do proper research and, and to get grants and to get funding, but more importantly to understand the theoretical basis, the theoretical underpinning of my day-to-day -day work. I was tremendously limited. So I decided to, to, to rectify that. So the first thing that I would, I would say to, to, to students is, is that 
you probably don't see it coming now. You don't know what's going to happen 20 years down, down the road. And a lot of students have a lot of pressure to get into a vocation and they think okay I'm going to be an engineer or I'm going to be a neuroscientist or I'm going to be a physician and then that's it and then my job will define what I need to know I'll just in essence look at the manual but what will happen I think to some of you is is you'll reach a level you'll be doing your job and you'll say but I really want to understand what it's about it won't be enough to just be following the manual maybe you'll be in a in a research program and you'll need to go beyond and what I've learned the hard way is the hardest theory to catch up on is the mathematics. And in medicine, for example, which is what I relate to both, we look at two type of things. We look at physical structures, so human tissue, human bodies, x-rays, images. We look at images, we look at structure, so we look at form. And the other thing we look, so form, remember that term, form. And the other thing that we look at is function, how things work. And for example, how the kidneys work, how the kidneys produce urine, how the heart pumps. And really, and this is an, an egregious reduction, but it works in a certain sense. Form is a static problem. It's a problem of understanding an image. And function is a problem of understanding a dynamic moving um, a dynamic moving situation, where things are in motion, where things are changing. And really, and it only occurred to me too late, is that the purest analysis of form is algebra, and the purest analysis of movement of kinetics is calculus. Full stop. It's that simple. And for humanity, you cannot go through life and be a sentient person and fully apprehend the world around you without understanding the importance of form and movement, no matter what field you're in. And the purest distillation of those constructs is mathematics. The last thing that I would say to the students, so some students, um, like me, had the problem of being overly focused on a, on a vocational target and didn't realize the importance of the philosophy or the understanding behind it until it's too late and actually impedes them. I see another class of students that I could really relate to because it was also me and it was sort of when I was an undergraduate I felt that I was being made to jump through hoops that I was being made to comply I used to say to myself oh my god why do I have to take math 101 that's what they called it in, in, in Toronto why do I have to take this calculus 101 course I want to be a doctor like what surgeon is doing calculus and, and I looked at it quite cynically but one thing that I realized and, 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 and they sort of come back to me now is that um, a lot of students are slightly subversive and that's good. They want to get beyond these what they perceive as irrational demands that the institution or society is putting on them. You want to sort of, you don't want to, to, to be overly confined by being told what to do. You want to express liberal thought. That's what university is about. It's about giving students access to liberal thought. And a lot of people feel, well, mathematics, that's not beautiful liberal thought. That's stifling. That's forcing me to jump through hoops. But I'll tell you something as a doctor. As a doctor, medicine is becoming very commodified, very commercialized, and also very corporate. And in my life, one of the a small corner that I've put aside is the time that I get to think abstractly, the time that I get to think theoretically. That's a time and space in my mind that's really mine and that it's pure. And all the commodification and all of the corporization can't take that away from me. It's this beautiful realm that I've managed to sequester off. And it's also the world of the student, a student walking around and protesting and trying to find a world that's more beautiful than, 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 than the sort of imposition of, their, of, the, of, the, of the world that they see. And so what I would say to the students is, if you invest a little bit, if you study this mathematics, for example, or more abstract theoretical fields, it will give you access to a realm that will enable you to change the world, that will enable you to make a better world, that will enable, enable you to inhabit a world that's more pure than what you're currently feeling some rejection towards. And I'm doing the same thing. And for me, mathematics has, has been very comforting in that way. And so I would urge you to, even if it doesn't, even if it doesn't hit you right now, keep it in mind. Keep it at the back of your head. This is pure thought. And pure thought is universal. And pure thought doesn't have a price. And, and, and therefore, pure thought is in a way subversive. 
and it empowers you to do what you want to do, to go beyond the system and outside of the system and change the world for the better.